do. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Professor Anne Toomey. Uh, Professor Toomey is one of Australia's leading and most respected uh, constitutional scholars and commentators. She is a Professor of Constitutional Law at the University of Sydney uh, and has previously worked in all three arms of government, uh, impressively, uh, the High Court, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Research Service, the Senate Legal and Constitutional Committee and the Cabinet Office of New South Wales. Anne's topic uh, for today's seminar is the use of Commonwealth power to use the ADF uh, to provide civil uh, aid during disasters and pandemics. So Anne will speak for about 25 minutes uh, and then Associate Professor David Letts will start uh, off the Q&A. Uh, David, just to introduce David, uh, David is the Director of the Military Law uh, program uh, at the ANU and also the Director of the Centre for Military and Security Law uh, also here at the ANU. Before joining the ANU, David had been with the Royal Australian Navy for over 30 years, so very well qualified uh, to comment on the, uh, the topic uh, today. Now, uh, as I said, there'll be time at the end for Q&A. Uh, um, just remember to uh, unmute your microphones. Oh, sorry. Um, if you have a question during the course of the seminar, just type question into your chat function. That'll come through to me and then I can moderate things uh, when we get to the Q&A and I'll call on you to ask your question. Uh, so uh, let me hand over to Anne for the presentation today. Okay, thank you very much, James. So what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to start by quickly whizzing through what I assume everybody already knows about the defence power and then move on to the stuff that we really don't know. Uh, because what's most interesting about this is how incredibly obscure it actually is. So starting on with the stuff that we know, uh, defence powers under the Constitution. Well, first of all, we have defence power. We have Section 51.6 which gives the Commonwealth legislative power with respect to defence. We've got Section 68 of the Constitution, which makes the Governor-General Commander-in-Chief. We've got Section 114 that says states, you can't have armies. Uh, and we've got Section 119, which is the quid pro quo that says that um, in those circumstances, the Commonwealth is obliged to protect the states from invasion and upon the application of a state um, from domestic violence. So those are the um, sources of power in the Constitution. We also know that um, from the jurisprudence that the defence power extends to dealing with external threats of violence against Australia. And we know from the case of Thomas and Mowbray, although I have to say I wasn't overly convinced by the High Court on this, but nonetheless, uh, we know from the High Court that that also extends to internal violence um, such as terrorism. Uh, section 119, as I said, um, also deals with the state applying to the Commonwealth to protect it against domestic violence. So again, some form of internal violence. Uh, and if one's looking for the legislative power to do that, then uh, one would imagine that would fall within the incidental power in section 5139 as incidental to the executive power, which is conferred through section 119. So that gets you through three sections to work that out. Okay, so they're the powers that we have. Uh, the next interesting point here is the Sharkey case from 1949, because in that case, Justice Dixon said that there's no Commonwealth legislative power to deal with matters of public order. Uh, but, um, uh, uh, sorry, he also said there was no power to protect the states against domestic violence other than with the state's request, but that where domestic violence interferes with Commonwealth operations, uh, then the Commonwealth may interfere to restore public order in order to protect those functions. So the classic example given by Owen Dixon back in those days was to protect the post um, from any kind of violence that stopped um, the ability to distribute the mail. Okay, these days it's not violence, it's Australia Post itself that's stopping the distribution of the mail, but anyway. Uh, in terms of the head of power for what um, Owen Dixon was talking about in Sharkey, um, possibly defence, but more likely a sort of a nationhood type of power. It wasn't terribly well articulated by 1949, but probably that's where we would place it today. All right. All of that leads us to understand what the basis then is for part three AAA of the Defence Act. 
because that's the part of the Defence Act that provides for calling out the ADF to protect Commonwealth interests. So that falls under the Sharkey um, type of example, and also um, to protect the states from domestic violence or the risk of domestic violence. And critically, it includes the ability of members of the ADF in fulfilling that role to exercise coercive functions. All right? And there are specific powers set out in Part 3 AAA that allow that. Now, here's the problem. Part 3 AAA does not extend to providing civil aid to deal with things like um, natural disasters, so floods, fires, um, earthquakes, pandemics, any of those sorts of things uh, do not fall within the scope of Part 3 AAA because they don't involve violence. Uh, and so the ADF's powers to exercise in a coercive manner, that kind of, um, those sort of exercises of powers, uh, don't apply in relation to ADF assistance to the civil aid in relation to those sorts of um, events. Yet, on the other hand, from a practical point of view, uh, it's often the ADF that has the things that are needed to deal with um, some kind of emergency. So, for example, um, it's, uh, it has the power to deal with, um, it has the personnel to deal with those sorts of things. It has the equipment, so it might need ships or aircraft or whatever to deal with them. Um, and it also has the skills that are necessary, um, such as, um, for example, building a bridge over a river when a bridge has been washed away in a flood or something of that kind. So the ADF actually has the ability to fulfil those functions in an emergency, but it um, doesn't have the statutory power to go and do so in a manner that would deal with um, these sorts of things using coercive powers. Now, if we come to the bushfire emergency at the beginning of um, this year, we see that another provision in the Defence Act was used, and that was to call out the reserve forces um, so 3,000 members of the ADF reserves were called out to provide civil aid, humanitarian assistance, medical or civil emergency or disaster relief. Uh, the source of power for that? Well, maybe nationhood power if it was a national emergency and um, it's left a little bit unclear. But in addition to those reserves being called out under a statutory power, the rest of the ADF uh, members, so that another 3,500 members were the, the ordinary members of the ADF. I don't know whether you should call them ordinary, but you know, the, 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 the normal paid up ones. Um, they were called out and deployed um, under a non statutory executive power. Uh, and the difficulty here, of course, is because it was non statutory executive power, there's no statute that um, allows them to exercise coercive powers. Part three AAA couldn't be used because, again, no violence was involved or expected to be involved. Um, and that meant that technically the ADF didn't have any power to do things like force evacuations or even things like entering private property in order to create fire breaks or it's those sorts of things. Um, and it was vulnerable in relation to issues like civil liability because it hadn't been given any statutory power to do these things. So that then raises the question of, well, what other powers might you have if you don't have a statutory power to do it? What kind of non-statutory power do you have to do these sorts of things? Now, again, same sort of issue arose in relation to the pandemic um, later. So from March onwards, we had the ADF deployed uh, to aid the police, um, particularly at the borders. Uh, and also to join police in terms of doing visits on people who were supposed to be self-isolating, et cetera. And there we had no use of statutory power at all. There was no formal call out. Um, it was just deployment um, of the ADF to do these things using non-statutory executive power. So what was the basis on which it was done? Well, within the ADF, there are um, innumerable um, various acronyms and the like, and one of them is DAC, um, D-A-C-C, -C, which is Defence Force Aid to the Civil Community Manual. And there's also a Commonwealth Disaster Response Plan, and both of those rely on non-statutory executive power. So the Minister for Defence announced when the ADF was deployed under DAC 
uh, that they would have no coercive powers uh, conferred upon them. And indeed, DAC specifically is not used in circumstances where coercive powers are needed. Uh, instead, you use Part 3 AAA, but of course, you can only use Part 3 AAA if there is circumstances involving violence. All right, so that's where we end up with these problems. So for the purposes of dealing with this, um, from a technical point of view, the ADF had to accompany police so that where any form of coercion was needed, so if you're on a state border and you're patrolling the border crossing um, and somebody decides that they're going to cross the border, um, uh, it's the police that formerly had the ability to do coercive things. Uh, the ADF were there wearing uniforms to give the psychological impression of extra force, whereas technically uh, they had no more power than any other ordinary person to be able to do anything. Um, so there was the visual image of state power um, in, at these borders and um, you know, doing checks on people at home, et cetera, when actually technically um, the powers of the ADF did not go beyond the powers of ordinary people. Okay. So that then takes us into this question of, well, what prerogatives are there in terms of deploying the ADF during um, these sorts of emergencies? Now, the first prerogative is the prerogative for the control and, and disposition of the defence forces. Now, this is, is quite an ancient one. Uh, in the U UK, this goes back a very long time. And for an awfully long time, the um, armed forces in the UK were, and you know, to some extent still are, um, completely based on the prerogative, you know, without statute to support it. And so this is, you know, quite an extensive prerogative power then to, to do that. Um, and did we inherit it in Australia? Well, yes, we did, um, at least to an extent. Um, so it's arguable that um, the Governor General as Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces under Section 68, uh, that that attracts uh, the prerogative in relation to the control and disposition of the armed forces, of course, upon ministerial advice. Um, it's not a reserve power. The Governor General, as if for those of you who are interested, Sir Sininian Stephen wrote a very good paper on this, which was published in the Melbourne University Law Review many years back about the basis for it, but that it's not a reserve power. It is a power exercised upon ministerial advice. But um, from our point of view, it involves the, the power to move the defence forces to deploy them in different places. So the Commonwealth can deploy its defence forces in Victoria or anywhere else, regardless of any need for any request by the state. You need a request by the state if you're going to deploy them for the purposes of using coercive powers to protect the state from domestic violence, but not if you're just physically moving them around the country. Um, they can do that. Uh, would raise quite an interesting question, however, as to um, deployment of the armed forces across borders where you've got um, pandemic control measures um, and Section 92, but I'm not going to go into that because that would be way too hard. Okay. So Commonwealth can move around its um, defence forces around the country and deploy them. Now, with respect to this particular prerogative, there's a great quote from um, Geoffrey Marshall, who the constitutional lawyers amongst you will know from the United Kingdom, where he says, the deployment and use of the armed forces is a prerogative power at the disposal of the Crown and there seems no reason why the Crown should need express authority to order troops to do what is lawful, lawful for anyone to do to fight fires, for example. OK, so that's a great quote because that tells us, you know, actually you can deploy your armed forces to go around fighting fires so long as they're doing what anyone else can do. And if a normal person can go out there and fight fires, if Tony Abbott and his mates on the back of the RFS fire truck can do it, then presumably the armed forces can too. Um, OK, so uh, that is... Um, a prerogative power, um, but we'll get then on to, in a minute, um, uh, how that actually applies in relation to the armed forces, because I think there are some difficulties with that. But before we go there, there's one thing I'd like to note, and that is the difficulty uh, in the intersection between the um, prerogative powers and statute because even though statute leaves space to deliberately for the prerogatives to be 
exercise, it does to some extent control them. So these are not free form um, prerogatives. So the one point I'd like to, like to make here is, is refer to Regulation 69 of the Defence Regulations 2016. And it says that where the ADF is called out to protect the state or Commonwealth interests, other than under a statute, so it's recognising that you could be called out under prerogative powers, the ADF must be utilised in a way that is reasonable and necessary to provide that protection, but must not be used to stop restrict, or restrict any protest, dissent, assembly or industrial action unless there is reasonable likelihood of death, serious injury or serious damage to property. So uh, you can see there that we've got on the one hand statute or regulation in this case, um, accepting that the prerogative will allow you to go in and do those things, but saying that when you do them, this is subject to this overriding regulation that says you've got to use your armed forces in this particular way. And so there's this tension between what is prerogative and what is statute and the extent to which statute controls it. Okay. So moving then on to this question of, well, what is it that you can do that any ordinary person can do? How does that work when it comes to the deployment of the armed forces? Because it seems to be that that is primarily what is relied upon in relation to aid to the, to, um, uh, the civil community. Uh, so the first thing I thought about when I looked at this, well, um, is, is it the ADF as part of the Commonwealth as a polity that is the legal person that has power to do things, or is it each individual member of the ADF who has that power? And I think both of those positions are problematic. I'd be quite interested at the end to hear from the real ADF people who um, actually know <laughs> which it's supposed to be and why. But anyway, um, from a constitutional law perspective, I thought this was actually quite an interesting question. So um, if we're talking about this in terms of individuals, uh, these individual members of the ADF are acting under orders. So they're not like ordinary individuals. They're acting under orders. Uh, they're within a system of, of military um, rules that say they have to obey orders. Uh, they're in uniforms. And they're also, and I think this is quite important, they're also subject to different laws simply because of their status that they're members of the ADF. So, for example, ADF members can carry a weapon or drive a vehicle without being subject to state licensing laws. Um, for those of you who taught Piri McFarlane nonstop, um, that, that little out um, of saying that the, that the Commonwealth had to apply by the, you know, driver's licenses, laws, et cetera, um, has actually been since overridden by legislation. So if you're a member of the ADF, there are certain things that you can do that other people can't do because of these um, statutory provisions. Another is Section 123.1b of the Defence Act, which says that an ADF member is not bound by state law that requires members to have permission to do anything in the course of their ADF duties. So members of the ADF are not in the position of ordinary individuals going out there doing things because they do have special laws that apply to them and that potentially makes a difference. What if an ADF member does use force or detain someone? Um, now, an ordinary person can, as we know, make a citizen's arrest. Uh, and there's very complex law about all of that and when it's allowed. Um, and they can also act in defense of themselves and self-defense and defense of others. But it's different if the ADF in the circumstances is actually acting under orders and acting as part of duties. And so I have some difficulty in trying to rationalise this idea that the ADF is, um, each individual member is acting as an individual member of the community, doing things that individuals are ordinarily allowed to do, when in fact they're in a very different position by virtue of their status as a member of the ADF. Now, the other argument is, well, actually, the legal person that we're talking about here is the Commonwealth as a legal person. So we've seen that arise in cases like Williams and the like, where the Commonwealth as a legal person has legal capacities and can do things like, you know, spend money and hire people and all the rest of it. 
Well, does that then somehow travel through the Commonwealth as a polity to its um, agents and representatives and employees to exercise those Commonwealth capacities as an individual um, human being? Um, well, one of the problems here, um, as you would have known from the Williams case, is first of all, it has to fall within your legislative or executive powers anyway, um, in terms of exercising those capacities. Uh, but secondly, the capacities cannot be exercised in a way that interferes with the legal rights of other people, for example, in relation to detaining them. And we saw that if you um, read Justice Gagler's quite interesting judgment on executive power in Plaintiff M68. So if it is the Commonwealth transferring its, uh, its powers as an individual on to members of the ADF performing these roles in their capacity as members of the ADF, then it's still constrained uh, because those capacities cannot be exercised in a coercive manner that affects the rights of other individuals. Okay, the next prerogative here, don't worry, I'm getting near the end. Uh, the other prerogative here is one that again applies in the United Kingdom, a bit more doubtful in relation to Australia, and that's the prerogative to deal with emergencies and self-protection. So in the UK, you've got um, cases like the Burma oil case, where they said there was a prerogative to protect public safety in cases of riot, pestilence and conflagration. Um, so we just say bushfires, but conflagration makes it sound so much better. Um, and in the UK, there's also a prerogative power in relation to keeping the peace and maintaining public order. So that Northumbria police case. Uh, very controversial as to whether that would apply here. And the reason is, of course, we are a federation. Uh, police powers are matters for the states, not for the Commonwealth. Um, although there might be an argument that in the case of um, a national emergency, um, where um, uh, in, in like PAPE, for example, where there's an um, recognition of a nationhood power being able to apply to a national emergency, uh, then in that case, maybe you do get these prerogatives to deal with um, emergencies and um, maintaining the peace, etc. But again, we get to the problem that the nationhood power has all those issues about whether or not it can be used in a coercive manner. And there's a lot of doubt about whether nationhood can be used coercively. Uh, so still problems, regardless of which way you try and um, manage that idea of um, members of the ADF being able to do anything that anybody else can do. Having said that, on the practicality side, um, if your members of the ADF are doing things that ordinary people can do, and by the way, for the most part, people are jolly grateful for them doing it, the likelihood of anyone suing the ADF in those circumstances is really low. And that sort of seems to be largely what the ADF relies on, that honestly, people will not go out there and sue you for entering their property to try and stop it from burning down. So um, from that point of view, maybe we're worrying too much about stuff um, that's not so likely to happen. Nonetheless, I think there is good reason to be concerned that there's a lack of clarity about these things. All right, last thing I want to talk about is the really tricky issue about um, legislative abrogation of prerogative powers. So again, there's this quite difficult interaction between legislation and the prerogative in relation to defence. So you've got section 51ZD um, of the Defence Act, um, which says that, uh, well, even though we have these measures in part three, triple A, and they could apply, uh, nonetheless, uh, the ADF can still do what they otherwise could have done if that part didn't exist. And you think, so they're trying to preserve the prerogative, but you end up with that difficulty that we saw in the Tampa case and that um, you need to, to trace back to the Royal De Kaiser Hotel case about, well, what happens if the executive on the, sorry, if the parliament on the one hand has set out legislative powers that do have a whole lot of restrictions in them on the one hand, and then you're saying, oh, by the way, I've got a parallel prerogative and I can just go ahead and do things without any of those restrictions. Um, courts are quite wary about that. Um, and so there's real doubt about whether or not those sorts of get out of jail, I've got a prerogative um, type of um, provisions actually work properly or not. 
Um, and so we saw a similar type of provision in the CPCF case uh, where Chief Justice French and Justice Kiefel um, didn't think uh, that that type of provision could actually preserve unconstrained and executive power that had been constrained um, by legislation. So whether or not that works um, is um, questionable. And then that gets you down to the very nasty issue in Australia as to the Tampa case and uh, what is it that actually abrogates legislation? Do you have to be explicit that you're, sorry, abrogating prerogative? Do you have to be explicit that you're abrogating the prerogative? Um, how do you tell that there's a necessary intention? How to clear do you have to be? Um, and I think my guess is that the High Court's more likely to move to the Chief Justice Kiefel line of that than, um, than perhaps the French line in Tampa. Okay, the other thing there to say about that, just before I wind up, is about the pandemic legislation. So anyone who's read the um, Biosecurity Act, and oh my God, it's long and complicated, uh, will know that there are very detailed powers in it, uh, which are likely to have abrogated prerogatives to the, of, by the ADF to respond in relation to these things. So for example, Section 103 permits detention of a person who fails to comply with an isolation requirement, but that detention has to be by the Australian Federal Police or by the State Police. So the ADF doesn't have power under that to do that unless, of course, the ADF uh, members were made special members of the Australian Federal Police under Section 40 capital E of the AFP Act. Uh, there are also other provisions in the Biosecurity Act that do permit ADF members uh, if they are qualified, and so that's then subject to what medical or other qualifications they have, but to be made biosecurity officers or human biosecurity officers under the Act, and then they can exercise coercive powers. So here's the dilemma. If you've got these provisions in your Biosecurity Act that say, say that the ADF can, in these very particular circumstances where they are, you know, made AFP members for these circumstances or biosecurity officers, if it says that, do you then have a prerogative for them to go out and do other sort of stuff um, in relation to a pand pandemic when biosecurity issues are um, at question without going through those issues of creating them and checking their qualifications, et cetera. I think there are real, real issues there about the Biosecurity Act um, abrogating the prerogative in relation to that. Okay, I'm at one hour, 1.29 p.m. And um, I think that's given me my whole full 25 minutes there, um, James. So I'm gonna pass it back to you. Oh, thanks very much, Anne, for a terrific presentation and also for keeping to time so nicely. Uh, I, I, I see that uh, uh, Michael Eburn has a comment and a question. But before I turn to those, uh, over to David Letts for, um, for some, some brief comments to kick off the Q&A. Thanks, James, and thanks very much, Anne. Um, unsurprisingly, uh, I think, you and I are in um, violent agreement in terms of our concerns and worries. Um, the first bit of writing I did on this was about four or five days after the announcement of the call out in January, um, where I, I raised in, in much smaller um, scope, perhaps um, some of the some of the issues that, that you've raised, and in particular um, the expectations. So, so I'll just I'll just comment, and perhaps that'll provoke. Um, some some questions and comments from others. Um, th there is a real issue about the potential use of force by the ADF, um, and and that was apparent in the bushfire emergency and equally apparent in in the pandemic. And and the longer that the pandemic um, continues, the more possible I think it is that um, various citizens are going to get fed up with the restrictions that are placed upon them. Um, and you then have a, a legal uncertainty that you have um, talked about uh, that creates an unfairness, not only to the public, but also to the ADF, unfairness and uncertainty that could be avoided, which is, um, I suppose, part of uh, what my concerns um, have been. I make the point that, it, that it's not uncommon that the ADF has been used um, throughout Australia's history of um, 
in, in various uh, types of, of uh, public emergencies. There, there's many examples of that taking place. But I suppose the scope and scale of what we've, we're seeing at the moment um, is a little bit unprecedented. Even the bushfire emergency only lasted a month and a bit, really, in terms of the ADF's um, direct involvement. So, so I've got some real concerns about um, using that. And, and the so-called the supporting role, if you look at the uh, website of the, of the Defence Force and the COVID-19 task force, as it's called, um, it's very, very clear on there that the ADF is involved in a supporting role. But what the hell that means is absolutely unclear. And um, as you've indicated, this, this coercive um, image of a, of a sailor, soldier or airman or airwoman um, somehow or other being necessary uh, for, for law enforcement officials to have them walking around the streets of Sydney, as I've seen pictures uh, of them, with, with an undefined purpose uh, and powers that are questionable, um, if existing at all, is, is completely unsatisfactory. Part 3 AAA of the Defence Act could potentially be amended to um, at least provide a framework that would accommodate these sorts of um, uses. I think there is now a public expectation and perhaps a government, um, both at federal and state and territory levels, uh, expectation that this asset should be used in certain circumstances. It shouldn't just be sitting idle um, while the country burns or the country um, suffers from the um, pandemic. But, um, but that, of course, puts pressures on what, as unsavoury as it might be, is, is the uh, predominant role of the Defence Force, which is war fighting um, and, and being prepared to undertake uh, that role. So, so there's a certain um, lack of synergy between this, and, and I know that there have been suggestions by some that there should be some other organisation, some other bureaucracy that is created with specific powers to deal with these types of organisations. Whether that's a good thing or not, uh, I don't know. I agree with your comment in relation to individual ADF members. Um, I, I think that is very difficult to um, characterise them as somehow or other uh, being uh, of their own mind engaged in uh, these activities in a way that would enliven these ordinary powers of a citizen. And, and whether that um, is ever going to be tested, uh, I'm not sure. Um, in terms of your comment about um, exposure to potential suit, um, here in the ACT, that's actually a live issue because uh, there was a helicopter uh, uh, during the bushfires that started a rather large fire that burnt most of the ACT. And there's property owners that, um, it was an uh, uh, army helicopter, I'm sorry for my army colleagues, um, wasn't a Navy one, and the Air Force don't have helicopters for those who aren't aware. But, um, but yeah, it started this very large fire and, um, and the landowners affected are quite happy to try and go for you know, the biggest show in town, which of course would be the federal government in that, um, in that case. Um, look, I think I'll stop there, James. Hopefully there's some comments that will uh, enable others to um, pick up some of these themes and uh, look forward to the Q&A. Thanks very much, David, and, and nice to see some military parochialism coming in there. Um, so, before I open it up to, to the questions on the list and to other questions, perhaps uh, I'll give Anne an opportunity to respond to what David has said. Um, and, and for me, uh, I also was interested in the idea of putting a statutory framework around all of this, not just to define the powers, but also to put a, an accountability mechanism around the exercise of these powers. I just thought if you had any comments on uh, yeah, well, look, I think it would be really important to do that. And it may well be this is what comes out of the Royal Commission. I did look at their interim um, suggestions um, yesterday, and um, I suspect they're, they're heading in that direction. Difficulty, though, is um, moving outside that kind of framework that um, Justice Dixon had in Sharkey, um, you know, the, that the Commonwealth can we know deal with external threats, we know it can deal with internal domestic violence, we know it can protect Commonwealth interests, um, but once you start getting into the nationhood power area, you've got that difficult question about coercive powers and whether or not nationhood will extend to coercive powers, or indeed the capacities will. And so there are real questions about 
the um, constitutional um, head of power for enacting that kind of a legislative framework. And I assume that that's the reason that the Commonwealth avoided doing that kind of legislation because then it doesn't have anything that someone can challenge in court. Um, but that has the poor consequence of leaving individual members of the armed forces vulnerable to suit. And that's not a satisfactory outcome either. So it'll be very interesting to see what the Royal Commission finally reports. Um, for anyone who hasn't um, had a look at um, what they've done, they're um, the Bushfire Royal, uh, it's not Bushfire, Natural Disasters Royal Commission, uh, has a couple of very, very good um, background um, papers and papers on constitutional issues. So they've um, clearly been thinking about this. Uh, the only other comment I'd make is um, one that came up because of um, something my colleague George Williams wrote in the uh, Australian the other day. He suggested uh, that the Commonwealth could legislate in a way that overruled the states on state borders by exercising its quarantine power in a way that covered the field so that the Commonwealth controlled quarantine and would then put sort of quarantine boundaries around hotspots, etc. And apart from the Melbourne Corporation sort of problem that might arise if you did that and the consequential litigation, it strikes me that from a practical point of view, I'd be interested in people's views on this, from a practical point of view, I think it'd be really, really difficult for the Commonwealth to implement simply because it doesn't have the manpower. I mean, I can't imagine if the state police weren't out there doing the policing of those quarantine areas, you'd have to put your armed forces out there. And I honestly don't think, you know, you could, you could seriously block off every road sort of in and out of particular suburbs that were hotspot areas all around the country using the armed forces. I mean, I, I, A, I don't think they've got the, the right power mechanisms to do it. And B, I think you'd be absolutely stuffed in terms of manpower to try and do that for hot spots in terms of, you know, ring fencing particular suburbs all around the country. I mean, if anyone could tell me that they reckon that that could be done, but I just think from a practical point of view, it's, it's, it's just not really feasible, which is presumably why the Commonwealth never did it. Anyway, I'll stop there and I'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Anne. I, um, everyone will have access to all the uh, comments and questions which have been typed through the chat function. Um, Michael Eburn makes a comment about uh, Tony Abbott being a member of, of the RFS, um, but also asks about um, the, the interplay, the interaction between the um, state processes and communal processes. Sam, White has responded to that by saying that one of the barriers is, is of course, the, the Bond case and the, and the need for the Commonwealth Parliament to authorise Commonwealth officers to exercise state powers. Um, That's right. Yep. And it might also give rise to questions coming out in the Hughes case about exactly how far the Commonwealth can authorise its officers um, without a, a, a clear head of, head of power. Um, and is there anything that you wanted to, to add to those questions? No, you very nicely <laughs> answered it. Thank you, James. No, they were the same sort of points I'd make in relation to that. Again, it's a, it's a really murky area. Um, all of this stuff is, uh, you know, the one correct thing that the Prime Minister said at the beginning of this is that it's all on the edges of constitutional power and, um, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty here. And I think there is certainly um, uncertainty in relation to the extent to which the states can um, confer power on um, ADF officers. Um, certainly you'd need to have Commonwealth um, legislation to authorise acceptance of those powers. But, um, you know, again, if you were trying to confer coercive powers on them um, in circumstances where the Commonwealth didn't have a head of power, um, I think it would be really difficult to know whether or not that would work. So yeah, hard area, not sure. And I see Michael Eben with his, his hand up. So Michael, over to you to, to ask a question. Um, building on that, I wasn't thinking so much of the coercive powers, but about the immunity from suit type provision. Mm. Because the emergency management legislation, uh, depending on which state and territory you're in, it either extends, um, you know, it's all, they've all got liability protection provisions for those acting in an emergency that extends to those who are, you know, basically allowing themselves to be subject to direction from the emergency manager or who voluntarily turn up and assist. Now, you can have an argument, I suppose, that the ADF personnel aren't voluntarily turning up assisting, which comes back to your point about whether it's the ADF uh, or, um, or the individual members. But there are those provisions that provide that anyone who's you know part of the emergency response is either uh, 
immune from suit or the state will wear the liability. So I wasn't thinking so much of the coercive powers, but whether that provides protection um, for the soldiers and the ADF generally, whether you ever thought on that. Uh, well, it might. Um, so that's that's something that one would certainly try to rely on in those sorts of sticky situations. If you're an individual and you were, I mean, I, I guess it depends very much on things like, you know, are you acting in the chain of command under orders or is it the case that, you know, you've been put on the, 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 the border barrier um, to try and, you know, to help the police in terms of stopping people illegally crossing the borders, but then something just gets out of control and you do something individual to help in the circumstances. Um, uh, or, you know, in relation to a bushfire or something or other. So it may well be if you're, you're acting under your own initiative um, to deal with some kind of urgent circumstances in the cases that you, you may well fall under those sorts of state um, uh, protections. Um, but I think if it's, if it's more sort of systemic, if you're acting as part of the armed forces under orders doing particular things, then it might be more difficult to um, say that the, the, the state laws um, exempt you from liability. Again, I, I just think this is a very murky area and I'm really not sure what the outcome would be. Hmm. So I have a question from Maria O'Sullivan. Hello, Maria. Uh, asking about whether or not the Commonwealth could send in the ADF, uh, even though a state has not consented. Uh, and um, yeah, there are issues around quarantine in Victoria where uh, apparently Victoria refused um, the assistance uh, of the ADF. Uh, so Anne, any thoughts? Okay, so look, there's a couple of interesting things there and this is one thing I forgot to mention, but um, one of the curious things about DAC, um, which is what they're using, so the Defence Aid to the Civil Community Manual, is that it actually says that um, uh, the states can only request aid um, at the point where they've lost control of the situation. So it says something like, uh, the scale of the emergency or the disaster must exceed or exhaust the response capacity and capabilities of the state before the Commonwealth assistance is sought, including assistance from the ADF. So the original argument um, about the fact that the state didn't use um, ADF people in its um, hotel quarantine, I've not seen anyone say this and there may be good reason why they haven't, but it would seem to me if I were the state of Victoria, I would have said, well, actually it's not an emergency where we've completely lost control. We, it, this is not exhausted our capacity. We can employ people to work in hotel quarantine. So we don't actually qualify for ADF assistance under DAC. Seems to me if the ADF is actually applying DAC properly, then the states wouldn't have been qualified to get that assistance. Um, uh, maybe I'm missing something there <laughs> because I haven't heard anyone argue it. I dare say they would have if that was true. But I mean, that was just my reading of DAC. Um, the second point, though, is I think the really interesting one, and that is um, can the state impede um, ADF members from crossing borders into the state? Um, so, say, for example, the, the ADF members were. Um, entitled to protect Commonwealth interests in the state. Uh, they certainly don't need a request to come into the state to do that. They, they are entitled to, to do that. Uh, can they then override um, the state laws in relation to it? They probably can to the extent that, you know, if the, if the Commonwealth um, legislative powers were um, seen to be inconsistent with the state law in that regard, then the Commonwealth law would prevail. So it might just be a 109 inconsistency thing, but that would only be the case if you're doing it under state legislative power. If you're just relying on the prerogative again, then you don't have that kind of ability to override. So interested if anyone actually knows, any of your listeners there know of um, that happening and how it was resolved. And, and from a policy perspective, I know that Defence um, has said that its people are going to comply with state and territory requirements for health. Um, I know I've got a student at the moment who's just come back from the Middle East. She's in quarantine for 14 days. So um, e even, if, even if legally there was some mechanism that would prevent that being absolutely necessary, their policy at least is, is yeah. in, in compliance with these um, activities. 
Well, that would make a lot of sense because, you know, you obviously have a duty of care to your own people as well as defence to protect their health. So um, you wouldn't be overriding those kind of things um, just for the hell of it. But, um, you know, in an emergency, maybe you'd need to. Who knows? So when Thank you, been... Anne, by the way. So there's a couple of questions there about the scope of the nationhood power. One from Sam White. Um, uh, about whether or not the nationhood power might get around some of the complexities where prerogative powers have been abrogated. And also a question there from Cameron Moore about whether or not uh, the nationhood power could be used at a level you know, below a na uh, national emergency. Okay. So I think the abrogation question is really interesting. Um, so there's an issue there about um, what are the rules? Um, <laughs> So if you go back to what Chief Justice French said in, you know, Pape and Williams and the like, he seems in some ways to be setting up the nationhood as a, in, a, in a parallel way or as a substitute for prerogatives. And we've got a reasonable idea of abrogation in relation to prerogative powers, although it's still quite messy in terms of the tamper and whether or not the High Court would follow a similar sort of route in relation to the, you know, the, the, the criteria by which you decide whether the uh, statute's been abrogated or not. But what's not clear is whether exactly the same rules apply in relation to nationhood. Um, now, I think it's Peter Stevenson has written about that and has suggested that, yes, the rules would be exactly the same in relation to nationhood as they would in relation to um, um, abrogating the prerogatives. So to the extent that nationhood is an executive power, not one given effect by 5139 in a legislative form, the argument is that it would be as abrogated as a prerogative but I don't think we actually know for sure. I'm, I'm not yet convinced that the High Court's actually properly sat down and thought that through. So I think that that's, um, again, another messy area, which is why all this is quite interesting because it is so messy. I'm, I'm sorry I'm not giving you decisive answers, but the reason I went looking into it because because it was interesting and it's messy and the High Court hasn't decided and there are no decisive answers. Um, so that was in relation to one bit of it, but I forgot what the other bit was. There, James, can you just remind me? Uh, oh, uh, so uh, Cameron Moore was asked about whether or not the nationhood power might allow um, Commonwealth activity to kick in at a level below a national emergency. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yes, that then leads to the question as to whether the High Court in Pape and Williams is really up the ante in terms of the point at which the um, nationhood power kicks in. If you go to the earlier cases like Davis and the like, um, it's, you know, is this something that's only really, it's something that's appropriate for the Commonwealth to do that the states aren't able to do, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, the Mason test from AAP. But if you look at what they say in Williams, um, uh, they, they, there is quite a bit of stuff there where they say, oh, well, this isn't an emergency. And so, you know, why do the state schools need to um, uh, uh, have chaplaincy schemes? You know, it, clearly it doesn't fall within. And you're thinking, well, they seem to have sort of raised the 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 um, the hurdle that you need to get over in relation to nationhood and that. And, and will that last? Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Maybe they were just having a bad day, having a bad mood in Williams. Who knows? They, they, they didn't seem very happy with the Commonwealth advocacy at the time, so that could have been it. Um, if you had a more sympathetic type of um, nationhood power um, and maybe helping out people in an emergency, which was less than a national emergency, maybe... Um, I had a bit of a chat with Sir Anthony Mason about this a little while back. Um, I was doing a bit of a phone check on him when, in, in, in time of isolation pandemic just to make sure he was, you know, okay. And we had a bit of a chat about nationhood and the extent to which it would extend to things like a bushfire when it was only in one state and whether or not it would meet the criteria of it or not. And he was pretty sceptical um, as well in relation to that. So um, there are, again, interesting questions as to what the scope of the nationhood power is. I have to say I'm a bit of a nationhood power sceptic, as you probably all know. Um, but anyway, every now and again, it's a handy thing and you do need it. So um, uh, I just think you need to have sensible boundaries on it and it would be helpful to know what the hell they were. And at the moment, we don't really, which is not good. Hmm. Thanks, Anne. Um, there's also a bit of an exchange between Zabina and David about... Um, uh, 
different ways in which we might assess uh, the the um, involvement of the ADF. Um, uh, Sabina suggests that maybe we should view the ADF's role as a capability enhancer and assess it um, on that basis. Um, David, I, th I think his response to that comment is that his concern is that in reality, the possibility still exists for uh, coercive powers to be exercised, or at least the ADF to be involved in a context where coercive powers are, are being exercised. Um, so David, I don't know if you wanted to add to that or Zabina, um, whether you wanted to add to that before I call on Anne to reply. Um, yeah, just briefly, I mean, that, that, that's part of my concern. It was right back at the start that um, when everything's rosy, as Anne said in her comments, um, you know, the assistance provided um, during the bushfires in the main was of people who were desperate to leave various places uh, and, and, and it was all welcomed and open armed. But, um, but that's not the only possibility. And, and we, in the last couple of days, we've seen a number of reports of uh, various members of society who've got a different view to authorities about um, what the um, conditions should be upon their existence in this country. And uh, the longer this goes, um, the more likely it is that a situation will erupt where um, ADF people, as, along with other officials, are um, in the vicinity and something needs to be, to, to be done. And, and I think that that's entirely predictable. Whether it happens or not is, is another matter, but it's certainly an entirely predictable scenario and one that should have been and could have been addressed. Uh, if, if you're waiting for me to respond, um, yes, I completely agree with you. I mean, look, I agree with both of you. I mean, the, the, the point of the role of the ADF in most of this is capacity enhancement. I mean, that's generally why they're there. Um, they're there to be able to do the things like physically building the bridge when the bridge has been washed away in the flood, um, to make the fire breaks during the fire, to help people restore their fences, you know, to clear the debris off the road and all those sorts of things. Um, but... The problem is that they are people who um, are trained to deal with force um, and are uniformed um, and there are certain expectations around them in terms of, of that role. Uh, and so it's not like having volunteers on the back of the fire truck. Um, uh, these are people that, that are expected to um, give effect to law and order when needed and um, that means that yes they are more likely in the end to be dragged into some kind of situation in which coercion is needed um, and yes I think David's right I mean the longer this pandemic goes on the more tetchy people are going to get and the more extreme actions are likely to be and I look a lot of this is being inflamed by the United States and what's going on there this stuff you know one of the bad things about globalisation, is not just good things about it, but one of the bad things is that we catch a lot of that stuff from other countries. And if people see people in other countries having violence and protests and whatever, it catches on here too. And um, that puts the military in a really vulnerable position when they actually technically don't have any statutory powers to, to do things. So I think we've got time for a, a couple more. Um, and oh, uh, before I forget, uh, uh, Anne and David, there are a couple of questions there about publications. Uh, David, I know that you had your article published in, um, in February or uh, whenever it was. Sorry, I can't remember the details of that. Anne, have you got anything published or uh, upcoming? Um, uh, with these yes, issues? upcoming on this. Um, so because I got a bit interested in it, the reason I did it was I was writing something on the prerogative for a Canadian project. Um, so there'll be something coming out in a Canadian journal, which discusses the prerogative in Australia, in which I have a fair thwack of it on the emergency powers. Um, but given that that's probably not going to get a big run in Australia, I might see if I can hive off the emergency section of my prerogative analysis and turn it into something else here because I think there's probably an appetite for people being interested in it because it is a very topical issue. I guess the problem with timing and publications is it's hard to know whether to wait until after the Royal Commission reports or before should you be trying to influence something that's happening or should you wait, see what happens to stop being gazumped in terms of what you write. I'm not sure, but um, I might try and um, hive off what I've done and turn it into something more local. Yeah. And Dave, your opinion piece was? Uh, it was in January. Uh, in 
which are Canberra Times and some other things. And I've got another article that's um, supposedly coming out with ASPE um, as part of their pandemic response um, thing, but I don't know quite what's happening with that at the moment. There's a question there about the National Guard in the US. Um, Anne and, or, or David, do, do you know anything about how that operates and whether or not that's a model that could not be me. used? Sorry, I'll pass on to David on that. No idea. No, okay, so um, move oh. on to, <laughs> oh, actually, let me check the time. Uh, no, we've probably got time for one more question. Um, uh, so uh, John uh, Crabtree has said that the potential argument for Victor the Victorian government to say that they didn't qualify for assistance, he can confirm that they took on liaison ADF officers, so that argument is not available to them. Uh, they also rejected assistance uh, with quarantine. Um, uh, Jacinta agrees with uh, David's uh, point. Uh, let me just scroll down to the last question there. Uh, the ADF is trained and formed for a particular role. This also shapes its uh, command and control arrangements. We've seen the differences between this and the uh, arrangements of police and emergency services may lead to misunderstandings and stresses in times of crisis. Uh, thanks, uh, Jacinta, for that. Uh, I think... Um, Oh, and uh, Sam White has given a plug to Cameron Moore's book that a lot of the questions um, that have uh, come out today may be found, or the answers to the questions may be found in uh, Cameron's book. Um, uh, and Crown and Sword. Um, yes, um, and it's very useful. I've certainly had a look at it. Um, uh, and there are a number of other books as well um, that dealing with emergency matters. So there's um, is a um, emergency um, management book by in CUP, HP Lee and a whole lot of people at Monash. Um, there's another emergency law book from Federation Press. Um, there's there's a few of them around and uh, one's also another military law book actually, I think from Federation Press as well. So there's a, there are quite a few resources on this these days, which is um, a very good thing. It hasn't solved all the problems, but at least it got more analysis of what the problems are. I don't think we are wrapping this up. Um, uh, Kristen Walker has just asked whether or not the seminar recording will be available. I think that's right, Ashley. Um, uh, Ashley Ashley's nodding her head. So, uh, Chris, yes, the recording will be available uh, and um, more endorsements for um, the Emergency Powers book uh, by HP Lee and um, Patrick Emerton. Okay, um, let me wrap things up. Um, I'd like to thank. Uh, and for what has been a, a wonderful presentation and like to thank you all for zooming in and for your questions and, and, and contributions um, and, and to David as well for his, uh, for his contributions. Um, really are extraordinary circumstances that give rise to the need to have this sort of uh, seminar. Um, and we're really, um, as I said in my introduction, we're delighted to have had uh, Anne come along and we're um, very happy that she's been able to navigate us through the, some of the tricky constitutional questions and issues that arise. So um, thanks very much, Anne. Thank you to David as well. And thank you all for joining us.